Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, folks, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. I am your host, Butch Theory. I'm joined with my trusty co-host this week, Captain Richard Rutland with Cold Blood Fishing. What'd you say, Captain Blood? Oh, shoot. Just glad to be alive. No doubt. It's so miserable outside, you know. Uh... <laughs> Weather outside is frightful, for sure. <laughs> Man, it's uh, blowing like 20, 25 miles an hour, raining. Not yep. really cold, but not comfortable. Not pleasant. No, yesterday was the same way. It was like 65, and it felt like it was 40 to me. It was blowing like 30 knots, and you just could not get out of it yeah crazy weather what you guys been up to i don't want to ruin the inshore report we're going to talk to captain bobby abrascato old bobcat here in a minute the other half of the wrecking crew so we'll get the inshore report from you guys but uh what you been up to man uh doing a little bit of fishing here and there just being a family man chasing some kids around (laughs) that's a full-time job in itself ain't it oh yeah i got my little uh little girl my little six-year-old's gonna turn seven next weekend so we got a big party planned at Hopefully we'll be celebrating two parties. We got Battle of the Grubs on Saturday, uh, Anna Claire's birthday is on Sunday. So hopefully we'll be double celebrating with a win. Heck yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so that's what? That's bog number three? three? Okay, yep. so there's five, right? Uh, Four. So the Winter Classic is part of that? No. Okay, okay, it's separate. Yeah, completely separate, yeah. Gotcha. Golly, but, time's uh, flying by. How's it February already? I know, right? <laughs> God, I posted something on Facebook the other day. I was sitting there with my wife. We were sitting there eating dinner. I'll look up the clock. Golly, why is it 6.15 already? Or how is it 6.15 already? That's pretty much what being an adult is. It's talking about how tired you are <laughs> and, and looking how, at the clock in yeah. increments throughout the day. How is it X15 yeah. already? I do that all yeah. day. How fast does life pass you by the older you get? You know, oh, it's like man. you blink and you blink and it's, a ne- you know, it's the next year already, you know? Yep. And of course, all the old timers or the people older than us, our parents are always like, you know, it never gets any better. Time's flying and you don't really believe it, but it's happening. <laughs> They speak of the truth. They do, man. They do. <laughs> but uh, we're talking about how miserable the weather is. The good news is, is that uh, it looks like we're going to have misery. What, today's Wednesday. We're recording on Wednesday. Yep. Thursday looks bad for rain. Looks like it's going to rain Friday morning. And then, like, looks like Saturday all in through next week is supposed to be pretty. Yeah, so. Saturday is going to be awesome. The high on Saturday is 51, low of 33. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to get pretty chilly. Ah, ooh, the high the high Friday is 48. Mm-hmm. That's gonna be chilly. Yep. I'm looking forward to Saturday, man. I'm uh I'm riding in the uh Dolphin Island parade with uh with my rodeo crew. Nice, that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm I can't believe those that. are happening already, too. There was one last weekend on the island, too, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. There was, oh, yep. Man. They always kick it off first on the island. Yep. In true form. All right, we have a great show lined up for you guys this week. But first, let's hear who's making the show possible. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have AFCO, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five-star Yamaha and Mercury mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street-legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric golf carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama. And also brought to you by Bahio Sunglasses. Want to catch more fish? Experience the clearest lenses on the planet with Bahio Sunglasses. Because you'll see more, you'll catch more. It's as simple as that. Try on a pair at your local retailer or check out BahioSunglasses.com to witness the magic for yourself. Bahio is an independent, sustainable, carbon-neutral sunglass company based in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. And also brought to you by Fishing Chaos, fishing tournaments coming up near you. Do you fish in a club? Do you manage a club? Does your club hold fishing tournaments? If the answer is yes to any of these, now is the time to reach out to Fishing Chaos. Get your club listed and managed on Fishing Chaos now for free. Contact Jesse Wilson for details at 256-508-1853 or go to fishingchaos.com to schedule a demo. All right, folks, in lieu of an offshore report this week, as you know, the weather has been a little bit windy and a little bit rough, so uh, could not get an offshore report this week. We heard from Tom Hilton last week, and he gave us a great offshore snapshot, but this week for report number one, we're going to go to Jeffrey Fadala for auto lighting of Alabama and talk about what size trolling motor do I need. And also, we're going to go check in with my buddy Joe over at the Northwest Florida Fishing Report. 
How we doing today, Joe? Doing great, man. What's going on? Oh, not too much, man. Just uh, enjoying this gloomy day in South Alabama. How about yourself? Well, you know, this time of year, January, February, March time frame is a great time to be thinking about upgrading your boat, making upgrades to your existing boat. A lot of guys right now are doing a ton of research on maybe they're getting a new vessel this year. Maybe they're wanting to make some changes to yeah. their boat from last year. And this is the time you think about those things because a fishing, it's a little bit slower. Uh, there's still opportunities. We're, we're going to get that fishing report, but you got some more time. Yeah. You got a whole season behind you. Uh, you're probably, uh, you know, either you've done your winterization or you're coming out of it and you're looking, you're thinking about spring, thinking about some warmer weather, thinking about what you're going to do to your vessel for next year. Also, you don't want to be doing that when it's, when it's time to catch Fish. No doubt. When we're in Now's the heat the of the season and every day's good, you don't want to be messing with this stuff then. So, you know, we were down at ICAST last year. Trolling motor market is not what it Crazy. used to be. Uh, it's nuts. I saw some trolling motors down there that were longer than boats that I've had. Oh, yeah. So let's uh, today really want to talk about what size trolling motor you need. You know, not only the length of the trolling motor, but also the voltage. I mean, really kind of break it down and help folks if they're considering a trolling motor for a new boat or an existing boat, by the end of the show today, you're going to know the answer to that question. Who we got today? Yes, sir. We're talking with Jeffrey Fadala. He's with Auto Lighting of Alabama. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. How are we doing today, buddy? Good, guys. How are y'all? Good, man. We, uh, we came up with the idea for this show. Like Joe said, don't even really know where to begin, man. I know you're the authority on the subject around here and have heard nothing but good things about your installation and customer service. So we figured we'd come right to the horse's mouth to get the education from the man himself. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for having me. You know, talking about trolling motors, first thing I think about is voltage, the length of the shaft that I need. So let's start there with the length of shaft. I think if you get that part wrong, then it doesn't matter. If you got the voltage right, you get that part wrong, we're not going to have a functioning trolling motor right. here. So how do you match the shaft length on a trolling motor to the boat itself? What, what kind of things does somebody need to be thinking about? How do you do it there in the shop? So, well, I've been doing this long enough that you could pretty much tell me just about any boat, and I can tell you what shaft would be proper for what vessel and, you know, what the sea height would be good for it, too. But there's really, there's two things that we base that off of. The first thing is water line measurement. So, the first thing you do is the vessel needs to be put in the water, and a measurement needs to be taken from the top of the gunnel to the water line. Whatever that measurement is, you add 24 inches to that measurement, and that will give you one foot of sea travel. So for the first 24 inches, I'm fixing to get mathematical on here on you, <laughs> the first 24 inches underneath the water is good for one foot of sea travel, and then every foot after that is good for two foot of sea travel. So if you have a total of 36 inches under the water, that is good for three foot of sea travel, and then on from there. So there is an equation to it. 24 inches is, is pretty much the minimum. You got to have, so if it's three feet from, from my bow, from that gunnel to the water line, I'm going to add two more feet onto that. I'm going to need a five foot shaft on that trolling motor. And that's going to give me the ability for that trolling motor to work in one foot seas. If so, if I'm planning on going out and fishing in more than that, which I'm not, you know, full, <laughs> full disclosure, <laughs> uh, I like it to be less than one foot, please. But for sure. if I'm going to go out in three foot seas, I'm going to want to have 36 inches below the water on top of that 36 inches above the water. And I'm going to need a six foot shaft length at that point. That is correct. All right. So what's my, what are my options in trolling motor shafts? That was one of the things that I saw at ICAST last year. I'm like, good God, these things have gotten long. They're putting them on all kinds of boats. What can we do? Well, shafts come in available lengths. And of course, you've got 12 volt, 24 and 36, but they're offered in anything from a 36 inch shaft to soon Rodan Marine will be offering a 108 inch shaft. Wow. Wow. Now, when you get into the 24 and the 36 volt segments, which are your most popular, 24 volt only goes up to a 72 inch and 36 volt, depending on the brand, goes from an 87 to a 108 inch motor. So that's your options there. That's my next question is how do we match voltage? You know, how do we make that decision? You mentioned 12, 24, and 36. Take me through your, your decision on that. Okay, so 
a 12 volt motor is going to be good for a vessel that's roughly between 500 to 1500 pounds is a good number. Uh, 24 volt, you're looking in the uh, 4,500 pound range from, you know, 2000 to 45. And then anything over that 36 volt is what would be recommended. But um, you also have to take into consideration not only the vessel, tackle, people, mm. bait. Sure, the loaded boat. Fuel, I'm, I'm thinking of, yeah, I mean, fully loaded down to the gills to make sure that you are getting the proper motor. Now, the rule of thumb is, Anything that's being taken offshore really needs 36 volt. You want optimum amount of power supply. You want optimum amount of runtime to be able to stay out on the water longer. 24 volt is more recommended for more of the inshore bay boat style. Not saying you can't use a 24 volt motor for offshore, but your runtime is going to be cut down quite drastically, especially with tide, current, wind conditions, all of that stuff that affect the uh, performance of the motor having to work harder or less harder. So when we think about shaft length, we're thinking mm-hmm. about that waterline measurement and the type of seas we envision ourselves fishing in, not necessarily the depth okay. of the water or anything like that. We're just thinking about seas. When we think about voltage, we're thinking right. really about run times, not so much power. I mean, if, we, if we've got a 36 volt and a 24 volt and we're running the same amount of thrust and the same shaft length, that 36 volts just going to give us more operating time before our batteries have to charge. That's correct. But that also being said, voltage and thrust are two different things. A 24 volt trolling motor is usually an 80 pound thrust or so. Uh, your 36 volt um, trolling motors are between 112 and 120 pounds of thrust. So for the most part, that's correct. So, so how do you choose on thrust? Like, I mean, for me, it's just, I always just think like more is better right is that true i mean what that that's correct why would we want to have less thrust is it just a price thing uh price is definitely a a player in that question but mainly at the end of the day the higher the thrust okay the larger the vessel the it can be put on and the longer the run time you'll get so essentially for one you don't want a trolling motor that's not going to be capable of doing what you want it to do as far as you know holding a vessel in spot for we see an average of i would say six to eight hours of run time on a 36 volt motor where a 24 volt system on that same boat is going to be roughly probably in the half range half of the run time so definitely more is always better when it comes to these uh, trolling motors and picking out the right model for your boat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. within, within your budget, of course. Certainly. But what about the type of fishing? We're talking a lot here and using the example of a spot lock situation, which I think a lot of our guys use, especially you got to have an inshore or offshore, man. You yeah. Gotta have spot lock. Certainly. I would think that uh, like our inshore guys probably don't use the spot lock as much as yeah, I'd agree offshore with that. guys. How do the needs differ for, for what we're thinking about in terms of, of the size trolling motor based on the kind of fishing you're doing? I mean, is the spot lock's got to be the number one consideration for, for offshore? Is that what you see most guys coming in for? It definitely is. I would say almost 99% of all trolling motors that are installed on offshore boats, they're strictly being used for spot lock. I mean, you get, you know, where you are, where you want to be over a certain spot, you deploy the trolling motor, you hit anchor mode, and that allows the captain to get away from the helm and be able to assist or fish himself. But I've never, I can honestly say this, I've never installed a motor on an offshore center console where the troll, you know, where it was actually being used for trolling. I mean, maybe to move over or jog over to one side or the other, but it's always specifically to throw it overboard and hold you in one spot. Definitely a a different um, game for the inshore guys from what I understand. All right, Jeffy. So primarily I use my trolling motor for, you know, working my way down a bank whenever I'm speckled trout fishing or redfish fishing or, or even bass fishing for that matter. Um, You know, we're talking about how long that you can have that trolling motor in the water, assisting my, assisting my boat, my vessel moving. I want the longest runtime possible on my trolling motor and my battery. That's just what I want to do primarily, run my trolling motor as long as possible. Does thrust come into play there? And as far as motor size, you know, your 12, 24, 36, what would get you your optimal runtime on one of these motors? Okay, so depending on which manufacturer you went with or decided to go with, you would want to go with your highest voltage 
which is going to be their largest pound thrust in that motor. Having that, you can control the speed, okay? You can control the amount of runtime at what speed you're going to use the motor at. And shaft length-wise, you can always adjust the shaft. So accordingly to what you're doing. So it's always, in my opinion, it's best to just go with the, the biggest, highest thrust you can get because it's there if you need it. Whether you need it or not, it's there. When you're using spot lock, less energy or power consumption is being used because the boat is going with the current, with the waves, and the only thing that the trolling motor is having to do is push into the current. So it's actually consuming less power than trolling. Again, like I said, because trolling is physically having to drag the vessel versus hold it in one spot. So it's a misconception I hear all the time that, oh, well, spot lock's going to, is what's going to burn all my battery up, power up. Well, that's totally not the case. It's actually the total opposite. 36 volt, more power, more runtime. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to hear you say that because back when we did the, uh, the lithium batteries show where we mm -hmm. kind of compared and contrasted lithium and lead acid batteries one of the things that i've noticed on the water about spot lock is that if my batteries are not charged you know we were running lead acid batteries if they were not charged okay. completely that spot lock feature would not function correctly when those batteries started to get depleted there wasn't enough power to run that spot lock feature the way it's supposed yeah. to run so it would just and shut it, off and it would just start wandering right it just start wandering it just wouldn't hold a position i could still you would and i couldn't figure it out i was thinking there was something wrong with my trolling motor because if i wanted to go forward i could go forward if i wanted to go in reverse i could go in reverse it wasn't that the propeller wasn't turning it's it just was a just, testament to your battery yeah and so i didn't know at the time that that it was because my battery was weak and you know, that's one of the advantages I think I see in the, in the lithium battery setups is that you've got the same amount of power, no matter if that battery is hundred percent charged or 10% charged, whereas lead acid batteries, you can't discharge them. Oh, I guess it's right around 50% or so. So do you see the same thing? I mean, you get a lot of complaints out of folks running trolling motors with lead acid versus lithium. And, you know, what do you think about the two technologies? Well, at the end of the day, Lead acid compared to lithium in the short sense is with lead acid, you've got, let's put this on a 36 volt platform. You've got three batteries that are going to weigh an average of close to 200 pounds or more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Runtime is not bad. I would say I see an average runtime on just three regular lead acid batteries from six to eight hours, but face, you got a dead body pretty much laying down in the bow or in a hatch somewhere. So you've got this dead weight. That's taking up a lot of space. The lithium situation is it's weight saving, it's space saving. You know, the majority of your lithium batteries are the same size as your standard group 27 battery, which just about everybody has in their boat. So space is definitely not an issue there. And then the weight, the majority of the weights on some of these lithium batteries are between 28 and like 35 pounds. Um, and just like you said, that lithium battery, when it's on, it's 100% at all times. There is no gradual you know, slowly dying where energy is eventually fixing to drop out. It's from, from the minute it's turned on at full power to the time that it's dead, you get 100% power gain out of it where you don't see that with lead acid batteries at all. They slowly drain, stuff starts flickering, acting crazy. You don't get that issue. You know when a lithium battery's dead. So Jeffrey, you've done a good job, man. Of uh, I feel like I could run out right now, take anybody's boat, put it in the water, I could call you and say, here's the shaft that we're going to need on this troll motor. Here's the voltage we're going to need on this troll motor just by knowing the weight of that boat and what we're going to carry in it. But do you see people buying one type of trolling motor and ended up coming back for maybe an upgrade? Like I, I just think about myself, you know, you were talking about how, how you take that measurement. I don't want to fish if it's over three foot seas, but sometimes I find myself out there. Sometimes it seems, it like, happens. seems yeah. like every year I end up out there on a day that I really didn't want to be out there. So what do you think if you, if somebody was on the fence and they said, you know, going between one link trolling motor and maybe stepping up in link, what advice would you give them? What do you see out of people that buy these trolling motors and maybe end up not being happy? Always go with the longer shaft. Always. I would say 
the most common that issue that I run into, and I'm dealing with this now as we speak, now that we've got a new year here for boats that I did pre-January 1, customers basically said they were fair weather fishermen. They'd never go out in anything over two, two and a half foot of sea, maybe three at the worst. Next thing you know, I'm getting a phone call. I'm not sure if it's because uh, the app that they were using on the phone wasn't registering properly, or they just decided that they were going to make a day out of it, regardless of what it said, or they had a buddy with them that just talked them into going into something they shouldn't. And next thing you know, I'm getting a phone call. Uh, motor's coming out of the water, and we're having to upgrade. When To begin with, I always try to recommend going with the the larger shaft. I'd rather you have too much than not enough. Plus, most people upgrade if they decide to replace or go to another boat. And why not have that extra shaft length for a larger boat? Very far and few between do you hear people downgrading their boats. So longer shaft is always, it's always better to have too much than not enough. That makes, sure. that makes me think about trucks, but you and I have this conversation, but like you may only need what the XLT F-150 has and its trim level, but there's a lot more people that are maybe looking for that Lariat model. So if you ever are going to have to go upgrade your boat or upgrade, maybe you do end up getting a new trolling motor in the future. I would think that that, that longer shaft is going to have more marketability on the used market too. Uh, going to be more people Absolutely. seeking that out as well. Yep. Well, man, I think you did a great job. I think I know exactly what I would need if I was going to go out and do this on a new boat right now. If folks want to reach out to you, talk about their specific boat. Uh, we were talking a little bit off air and you said, hey, you just about got all the measurements down. If somebody calls you up and says, this is the kind of boat I've got, they're not even going to necessarily need to go put it in the water and take the measurement. You already got all that stuff. How can they reach out to you okay. and, and you know kind of figure out their setup? So my personal cell phone, 251-379-6934. You can call me anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I answer the phone. And I'm glad to help. You know, my shop is always open to people. I don't run customers off for coming up. If you've got questions or curious to see what a uh, motor might look like on your boat or just want to see, got customers that come in all the time. They bring their boat up. I'll snatch a motor out of the box and we'll sit it up there and give them ideas of placement, where it's going to go, how it'll ride when it's in the stowed position, where we'll pay, place the batteries. And I'm I'm easy. I even, I've had, matter of fact, this past Saturday, I had a customer that uh, drove two hours just for me to do that because that was the only time he could get off. I met him up uh, here Saturday around 10 o'clock and um, he ended up leaving his boat with me and we're going to put a motor on it. So I'm always available. I always answer my phone. Very cool, man. Well, thanks for answering our question. Very educational segment. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. We enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate you. I love these segments we do, Butch, just to kind of, these are all questions we all have, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a fishing report, but it is very relevant. And I love the fact that, you know, we're going to be able to come back to this in the future and just answer that question. Oh yeah. Well, what was that measurement again? Yeah. Well, in trolling motors, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, what they really, really, really gained popularity probably last 10 years. For sure. I mean, I don't even know. It's one of those situations where, now that you've experienced how do you fish it, for that <laughs> how do you fish without it especially yeah. especially for holding up on a spot man no if, doubt if, if you've got the console. ability to use these things to hold up on a spot why would you ever want to not <laughs> yeah i wouldn't I man yeah. i think what i picked up most from today was don't skimp you know we all try and be frugal i'll use frugal prudent right but i mean you've spent how many hundreds of thousands of dollars on your boat you know if you got a seventy five thousand dollar bay boat and you really need the longer shaft with more thrust. Don't save yourself two or three thousand dollars. Go with the Mag Daddy. Yeah, or whatever it ends up being. I think we've all done it in maybe lots of different walks of life where we're just trying to be, like you said, prudent. We're trying to use our dollars wisely so we get just enough. Like we're we're kind of right on this, the edge this of should, enough. This should work. This should be all I need. And then after a season of use, we're like, you know what? That's not enough. Let me go back and upgrade. And you end up spending more money. Definitely more time. Than you would have if you just gotten what you need in the first place. So yeah. that's what Agreed. I like. agree with you on that. I mean, I think I just took away from this, like, go ahead and get a little more capacity. It's just like with a truck's towing capacity. You don't want to be bumping right up on the edge of that towing capacity. You want that yep. truck to be easily, be able to easily handle Tow whatever, whatever you need, tow yeah, whatever you want to do. Extra in the tank in case you decide to, uh, you know, load it down with a bunch of gear or whatever. Yep. It sounds like Jeffrey's got it going on over there and can pretty much fix anybody up. Deals in multiple kinds of trolling motors, so hook you up with whatever you need. 
Yep. All right, buddy. I'm going to go get the rest of these reports. Sounds good, man. Let's knock it out. I'll talk to you soon. Enjoyed it. Me too. All right, folks, that was another great segment. Let's take a quick break and hear from a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. And also brought to you by Advanced Transmission. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. All right, Butch, let's go on and talk down to the other half of the wrecking crew, Captain Bobby Averscotta with A-Team Fishing. What's up, Bobcat? It's all good, man. It's all good. Glad to be on here. It's been a while. We haven't heard from you in a while. I thought you forgot about us. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's right yeah i had to text y'all my number so you to make sure you had it <laughs> well i don't think i've talked to you on the on the air since y'all's winter classic victory so congratulations thank you sir i appreciate that sound like a heck of a trip sound like a heck of a, a nautical day of fishing it was yeah it was uh, i don't know how much y'all talked about it but it was uh it was kind of a neat win uh for me you know for us i, I just uh the, you know after the way our day started the second day and to pull off what we did is kind of just that's what makes tournament fit. it all makes it's all fun you know and it's fun when you win but the way we uh the comeback we made you know on sat sunday and you'd had to be, it's one of the deals you had to have been there to know what i'm talking about but it was really cool how we went from being down in the dumps to think and i'm thinking to myself gosh we're gonna drop like a rock to you know with literally within almost an hour i guess rich don't you think or maybe a little bit more than that we went from zero to hero and that's you know that's <laughs> classic trout fishing man yeah. you know and one of the things that made it special is we just didn't give up it was uh it got richard might already talked about it but it got mighty quiet on that boat from about seven or eight in the morning till about nine or nine thirty ten o'clock it was real quiet on that boat yeah it was uh i tell you i was uh, i was kind of talking to a buddy about fishing a swordfish tournament coming up in april or whatever and uh yeah, we're just kind of talk about trying to put the right crew together and all that to go do it because it's going to be uh, two and a half days of fishing and you got to have the right crew out there. And I, I was just telling him the, the fun part about tournament fishing for me is number one, all the preparation. I think it's a lot of fun tinkering all your stuff, making me sure too. all your stuff's like make sure your knots are tit tight, your rods are ready, your drags are set. Me too. That's right. You got good line on there, making sure all your, but you, everything on the boat's good to go. You really, really got to fine tune everything. And then the grind, like just grinding and mentally keeping yourself in the game, because if you let yourself go mentally, you're going to be riding around yep. <laughs> like, you that, know, uh, that, look, look at what everybody else is doing or something. I don't know, but you just have to grind and grind and grind. And it's such a mental thing and that's uh that's what's fun to me is overcoming that yeah you hit the nail on the head man that's the deal man is that that mental part of that thing when it gets tough it's easy to fish hard when you're whacking them right (laughs) you know it's real easy to fish hard then you know but when it goes bad man and you stay in it that's the deal especially when it really starts to happen and you know you you grind it through that and until you finally hit on something that uh, that makes it real special i we run several tournaments over the years but man that one was for some reason i don't know why it was really a kind of a special deal just because of the way we we hung in there you know yep. knew what we had to do and it didn't come together real well and we still didn't give up i would say the two most important things there are consistency and confidence you know yep. you talk about breaking your mental, I mean, that's, that's a big thing. Confidence and consistency. You just got to keep after it, keep your head down and know what, you know, keep doing what you know is going to produce. Yep. And that's what was kind of special about, especially in the conditions we had to fish that weekend too. It was, would have been real easy to kind of throw in the towel when you got your reels kept icing up and the guides (laughs) are icing up and, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, you're having to stick your hand in your pocket after every cast and things like that. Yeah. Bobcat was over there jigging a little bit, jigging that slick lure back or whatever. I was like, I said, Bobcat, you got a guide loose on your rod? Is your rod broken or something? I was like, no, bro, that's ice on that, man. <laughs> <laughs> All the rods were icing up. The little uh, level wind on our bait casters was locking up. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was tough, man. That is tough. Definitely different for a South Alabama tournament, I can tell you that. You know, and just taking that a step further, talking about that, and we, Rich and I talked a little bit about this kind of afterwards, is, 
you know, the, the other guys that hung in there and came and fished the second day in those conditions when they had terrible sacks the first day, those are the ones that I was impressed with because there is no way. I told him several times, I said, dude, if we'd have caught two fish the first day of the tournament and we were that far out of it, you'd have been fishing by yourself the second day. There was no way I was going to show back up yeah. if we weren't within striking distance, you know. And there were some guys that showed back up and fished all day. It just blew me away, man. They would do that. That's awesome. That's loving it right there. That is. That's yeah. right. That's loving the competition and just wanting to be in the game mm -hmm. well what you been up to captain bobby uh i'll let you guys kind of talk it out i know you guys have been fishing a good bit doing some scouting obviously don't want any trade secrets coming into tournament season no well we don't have any right now so don't worry about it we can't give any away right now <laughs> that's right that's right so the bog is the bog is two weeks away yeah. so y'all can believe what they two say this away. week right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right uh i've had some pretty good trips man you know especially when you consider i left one morning this week uh there's past week uh you know with 46 degree water temperature and um you know fished all day and it never got over 50 and still catching some fish on slick lures my by far the best size lures we're catching on is on slicks you know but i've been kind of doing it a little bass backwards and you know, starting with some deep water stuff early and jigging for them just to get some fish in the boat and then going after those bigger ones. It just seems like if that water comes up, you know, along with the tide coming up, the bigger fish that are there start to want to cooperate a little bit better. Just had some good fish uh, jig fishing. As a matter of fact, as we speak, I'm, I'm going through some jig heads right now. And as usual, you know, and I don't do a whole lot of jig fishing. I think I'm out of jig heads and I went and bought some I don't know, 20 some odd dollars worth of jig heads. And I was going through my stuff and just found a gallon Ziploc full of jig heads that I had in the drawer. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So now I got two gallon Ziplocs of jig heads, you know, so. Well, that'll get, anyway, you've been uh, four or five years on that as much as you jig fish. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll never run out of them because next year at this time, I'll go buy another gallon bag full of them, you <laughs> then know. find the other one. That's right. Bobcat, you're talking about uh, doing some jigging. What size jig head you've been using and what color have they been hitting on lately? Well, it's glad you asked about the jig heads because it's been a that's been a key part of it is uh, fishing some depending on if the water's moving or not. The key has been sticking to the bottom and making sure that those baits are getting to the bottom. And um, so with that, I, I don't carry anything heavier than three ace. And I've even had to go to three ace on some of my lights. Usually I carry a quarter or three ace on. And I've been pretty much even on the light spinning rods going to three ace in some of the water we've been fishing because it's been so important to stay in touch with that bottom. And it's not a finesse thing. You know, when you start fishing 12, 15, 18 feet of water, you know, you don't have to worry about it being fancy and having the thing sinking horizontally. It's way more important, as you well know, to have that thing hitting the bottom before you start working it. So I've been using quarter and more to three eighths even to get it down there and make sure that's staying in contact with the bottom. And it doesn't mean that we, we still jig in the rod, but you got to let it settle back down on the bottom to get bit. And, you know, when I can get the guys doing that, man, well, they all start catching fish, you know, but it's really, really important, man. I, I texted Richard some pictures of some fish that I caught the other day. And I mean, the bellies are all raw where they're rubbing in the mud and they got these little worms on them that tells you they're sitting right on yep. the bottom. And they'll come up off the bottom a little bit to get that lure, but you better, you know, you better not have that thing swimming up 10 feet or so, you know, or four or five feet off the bottom or six feet off the bottom if you're fishing in that depth of water this time of year. And that's been the key. So, uh, and as far as colors go, I've been looking at the water and some of the rivers as they drain, the, the fallen water actually gets clearer. And we've been using more of a subtle color, like a root beer, a, kind of a motor oil color. And then um, I noticed when it starts coming in, the water starts coming in from the bay, it muddies up. And just going to a brighter color, like a white or pearl white, and that chart, they really seem to like that chartreuse tail, you know, on them. So, um, and then the other thing I've noticed, and this is more getting back to the point of staying in touch with the bottom, is I noticed that we uh, we catch a lot more fish when I'm doing the deeper jigging like this with the straight tail or, or the little single split tail grubs versus the paddle tail grubs, because I think the paddle tails will get down there. But that straight tail gets down so much quicker, you know, and you're, mm -hmm. you're in the strike zone a lot longer with that shape of lure than the paddle tail one, which is what I really prefer when we're up in about, you know, eight feet of water or less. So it's been, you know, kind of a combination, of all those things coming together to get it done. And then, you know, we use exclusively braid or fluorocarbon this time of year. I, I just couldn't even imagine trying to feel some of these bites right now with, with monofilament, you know, so, uh, those those things are all coming together to get it done when it gets this cold and you do that deep water jigging like that. And I think that's going to be the deal for about another, shoot, at least month is the way I'm looking at it. One thing you were, you got my wheels turning when you're talking about the straight tail thing. 
I don't know that sometimes when we do have, when, when we have this temperature drop in the water temperature and we can tell these fish are getting glued down to the bottom and you're having to make contact with the bottom to get bites like what you're talking about. I don't know that their diet doesn't change some too. And they're eating some of those creatures down in the mud versus just honing in on pogies or can't be any shrimp around right now, you know, so. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. I was thinking more about the, the idea of actually keeping it down there, but that's a great point you bring up. That may be exactly what, a lot of what's going on right now. Is they're just living on what's down there. Yeah, eating something a little different than what we're used to throwing. Yeah, a friend of mine that I follow down in Florida, he actually put a picture up this morning of this eel that a redfish threw up you know, uh, in the mm -hmm. live well or something like that. And, and he actually was kind of laid out a couple different lures I and mean, like, man, it's funny how this one lure right here has been working. That looks like, looks like this eel that this fish just threw up right here. You know, it was <laughs> kind of going into, uh, how they're experiencing gotta be something to that. Yeah. Well, they're, they're experiencing some of what we are too, where the water temperature is getting down and these fish are kind of hunkering down on the bottom and they got to eat you know, to stay alive or whatever. So they're just going to eat anything that moves down there, you know, but sometimes I think that's what's happening. You know, they're eating like these little eels or worms or whatever lives in all that mud down there on the bottom that, you know, we have a lot of muddy bottom around here. So I don't know. You just got to think they're scavenging anything they can to survive. Yeah. Adapting. Um, you yeah. know, and to that point too, you know, contrary to what a lot of people think that, you know, trout just live on shrimp and pogies, they eat anything you know we're not even talking about redfish really eat anything but trout are pretty opportunistic feeders you know what i'm saying they eat you know they eat a lot of squid i remember we were talking about this on one of the shows you know how we'd be surprised how much squid they actually eat but they eat mm -hmm. a lot of squid they eat obviously shrimp pogies mullet whatever but if you look at, at the, all the different things you've caught trout on over the years you go like you know what you're right and to, like his point I, I had one talking about spit that i had one spit up a ribbon fish one day you know and oh, i wow. never in my life thought they would eat it. yeah never in my life thought they'd <laughs> eat a ribbon fish you know and yeah so that's you know it's a great point it's because there's probably not a whole lot left available to them you know no not down that way i wouldn't think so yeah I got, I got a couple of cool ones, uh, with trout, with things I've seen them eat. Uh, one time I cleaned a fish that I caught off the Gulf beach that had a ballyhoo inside of his stomach. <laughs> Another oh, time God. over the years, a handful of crabs here or there, you'll find a crab in their stomach. Yep. And then the one that really sticks out to me is, uh, I caught one up in the Delta one time in the Spanish river that had a crappie in his stomach, <laughs> you know, like a little, like a little, like four inch or six inch long crappie was in his stomach. And, uh, so anyway, that you're right about that. I was actually talking to a buddy of mine this morning who, uh, who commercial fishes and he was talking about, uh, fishing sheephead or whatever. And, uh, I was like, man, you may catch any fish down where you are, any trout down there. And he's like, he's like, no. And he was kind of talking about it. He's like, man, I tell you what I did do the other day. I caught a, uh, caught a trout on a, uh, on a fiddler crab, you know, sheephead fishing, you know? So yeah, like you said, they're definitely op opportunistic. They just hungry. Yep. They're hungry and that's it, you know, and they're not probably not going to spend, I wouldn't, they're not, I know they're not going to spend a whole lot of effort foraging right now. They're pretty well stuck where they're at, you know, so it's going to be what's available to them, you know, almost, you know, put you in that mind of a tad you'd fish a flounder, you know, but yeah, so that's kind of getting back to it. That's the deal, you know, and um, I didn't think about it being, you know, representing what they're feeding. I was thinking more of a time from a functionality standpoint of, you know, getting that bait down there and making it easier to, you know, stay in touch with the bottom, you know, and, but so that's a great point. So this time of year being, it's finally getting cold here in Alabama. Um, <laughs> we've been talking yeah. for months about, you know, the fish being in deeper channels and things like that. Um, the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about, you know, middle of the day and the warmer days, those fish being up on the flats. Are you guys strictly fishing, you know, the deeper channels and 10 foot or below, or is there any, is any, any flat stuff going on right now, Captain Bobby? Well, I, you know, like I mentioned, I, you know, I've been kind of waiting until the, until the water warms a little bit, you know, to get out there and start doing some of that flats. Cause I, you know, a lot of those chan, all of the channels have flats adjacent to them. There's some shallower uh, areas that they can actually move very easily get, and get up on, you know, so I'm doing it kind of a little backwards in what you, you know, kind of normally, usually I'm targeting the bigger fish out on the shallow stuff early and then going deep, like you'd maybe do in the summer. And this is kind of backwards. You know, when it gets this cold, they're always going to be near that deep water. You know, not only are we getting 
you know, extremely cold water right now, but we're getting really low water events. We're getting really, really low water, you know, so you, that column really cools off, you know, overnight. And when the water gets real low and the water, air temperatures drop, it really cools that narrow column. And they, they instinctively know where they have to get to to survive. You know, with that, I've been doing some of that a little later in the day, you know, and, and that's the success I've been having on the bigger fish is to pull up on those, you know, on the flats, or close to the flats on the ledges more so than in the channels a little later in the day and focusing more on the channels at least early to get the bite started sure you know while we're talking about like this water temperature thing like what kind of bobcat was hitting on there about that we're getting these low water events and it cooling off at night and one thing i always try to think about this time of year you know and we talk about this one here before you know but it is are, are we in a cooling phase with the water temperature or in a warming phase you know and you kind of need to adjust to that and the fish, it takes the fish a little while to adjust to that as well. One thing I kind of been doing a little bit lately is uh, I've been in some areas, been kind of doing the same thing Bobby's talking about with fishing some jigs. And uh, the other day I was, I was getting hits and I couldn't get a fork in one, you know, like I'd feel a bite and it wasn't like this big hammer bite or anything, but I'd go to set the hook and I'd probably whiffed on about 10 bites in a row. And uh, I was using a, a uh, little bit bigger size grub. I've been throwing some of these down south lure uh, grubs lately. They're a lot bigger profile. Anyway, I just kind of got tired of that. And I said, oh, man, let me try something a little bit more subtle. You know, as so I took my little, uh, little slick swamp thing on my, uh, with my swim bait hook that we've talked about on here before as well and started throwing. And I swear to God, first bite I got, I hung one next cast threw out there, got a bite, hung another one, you know, and I don't know what it was about, you know, mm. stepping down that the bait size and the weight, you know, has started to kind of make a, uh, trying to, I don't know, I guess, uh, letting a little bit of light in, you know, on, on the situation, you know, because, yeah. uh, and Bobby and I experienced this during the winter classic when we had one of these cooling events, you know, heck, how many bites you think we got on Sunday, day two of the tournament where we didn't, oh. where we didn't hang one. It must've what between the two of us, what, maybe yeah. 15 bites in the morning. Oh uh, yeah. So it was even like the first day too. Same thing. We started counting the number of bites first, but you're right. Yeah. We got a lot of bites, you know, missing the fish with the big lure. Right. And heck, even those two days I was trying to, well, I guess I did kind of, uh, start to hit on something with that little slick on, um, uh, on day one with that when we were experiencing that and then day two was even worse than day one on that mm -hmm. yeah, but i bet we got a dozen or 15 bites you know and set the hook and there's nothing there and it's like when you have these cooling things i just feel like they can't pop their mouth open and suck that lure in quite as aggressively You're as they can when yeah when they kind of when they kind of settle out after a couple of days of that cold Right. They settle out, you know what I mean? But right when it hits them, man, that's, and we're probably going to kind of see that going into this cold weather on, you know, Friday and Saturday when, yeah. when this temperature's supposed to drop back out. So it's going to cool out big time. I think doing downsizing and, and slowing, slowing your roll and your presentation is really going to go a long way. Yeah, I think one of the things, too, just to add to that a little bit more, too, that, you know, you were talking about it finally getting cold, or just a little bit ago, you were talking about it finally getting cold, and it feels to me like uh, in the last couple of three weeks, now that this water temperature's gotten here and stayed here, that the fishing's actually gotten better than it was the first two weeks of this of January when it just shocked them so hard. We went from fishing in shorts and, you know, 68, 70-degree water temperature just instantly in this, you know, literally overnight the water temperature just dropped and it just man, the first couple of weeks of, uh, of the year were tough. And it wasn't just me. It was everybody. We were all talking about it. It was tough, but I, to me, it feels like they've kind of acclimated to it and they're where they're going to be. And, you know, it's not like they're jumping in the boat, but they're willing to bite now. You know what I'm saying? And they're where they're supposed to be and they're staying put. I think some of that's gone on too. Now, again, I don't want you, you know, I want to lead you to think that you can't go, you can go out there and just toss a grub over the side or a slick lure over the side. And you're going to catch a box full of fish. You still got, you still got to go fish for them, but it just feels like to me that they're, they're there. And, and, you know, if you're at the right place, you know, at the right time and willing to work for a little bit, you can catch plenty of fish. Yes, sir. That makes sense. You know, you're talking about the crazy low tides right now. I mean, past couple of days earlier in the week, this week, I mean, the tidal rivers, it's been lower than I've ever seen. <laughs> How does that affect your day? You know, if you have to go fishing that day on the low tide, I would assume that there's pros and cons of the water being that low. Does that excite you or does that turn you off and how do you approach it? Well, we plan on it. We know that's going to happen. You know, like this week we were on the new moon. That's the low tide in the January, no, right. new moon, the winter new, new moons are the, the low tides. 
Couple that with a hard north wind and high pressure, and you're going to have low water. And we expect it. You know, we know it's going to happen, so we we plan on it. And the one thing, like we were talking about, is the river channels. That's where you're going to need to be anyway, because a fish they don't have any water to get out in the shallow stuff. You know what right. I'm saying? So it it really kind of bunches them up. They have places uh, I've heard about in South Florida, South Texas, where they get these, and they there's a term they call it. It's something like a God's Dream Day or something like that. But the fish <laughs> just drop into these potholes, and they're just you know they're, it's fit, literally fish in a barrel, and they yeah. just and that we don't have that uh, we don't have that type of thing going on. But it's kind of that similar concept of where sure. you know the water level drop to the point that we know that you know certain areas we just don't even think about them on low water we go like well we're not going to do that and, and we won't go back there for maybe a week if it stays low because it you know they're just either not there or they moved off of that type of stuff those real shallow flats we got what rich and i talk about all the time oh, that's a low water spot or that's a high water spot you know we talk about that a lot oh, yeah. when we're planning our trips both tournaments and guide trips you know and there's places that we know we can be effective on high water and in places that that don't work on on uh, low water and yeah it definitely makes your plan but the good thing is like i was just talking about where they're at right now you know we're catching them let me just say i don't know if it, i'm gonna see if it helps but it doesn't affect it because that's where we're gonna be anyway you know what i'm saying so uh, i got places and I, and I know richard a lot of us do have places that it just i don't even it, you know the biggest problem is finding the ramp to get the boat in the water yeah <laughs> you, know, you gotta figure out which ramp you can go to to get the boat in and out of the water you know yeah. that's the big challenge sometimes you know once you get over that hump you know we usually can figure it out from there one thing i swear to god i've heard bobby say about talking about deeper water and some of these things and it, it's relative you know rel you, you sure. need to find deeper water relative to the area that you're in that's going to vary tributary to tributary or tidal river to tidal river it's going to vary that's right and and that's going to be the same across the board for every tidal river every flat every everywhere that you're going to be fishing right now when you find these low or negative tides or whatever and and find those conditions wherever you're going to go fishing you need to find the deeper water relative to something and sometimes that means like in one river 18 foot of water is is the deep water relative to everything else in other places it means it's like four or five foot of water you know so yep. that's kind of how you need to think about it you know and uh bobby that's the term you were looking for you're talking about those florida guys i've probably heard uh uh slick lure joey old uncle joey talk about the a negative tides all mm -hmm. the time and how much they love fishing those negative tides and for you know like what you said it it Just pulls all, them all that water gets yeah it pulls all that water out of there and the fish got one place to go and live and, <laughs> and uh they gotta be there <laughs> yeah yeah because anywhere Captive else they gotta be like on dry land you know or on top of right. some rocks or something so they got no choice that's a that's a good way to think about it Yep, and it's a good question, too, because that's a definitely something you have to deal with this time of year, you know, and um, you better plan on it, you know, when you get, get you know, the type of weather and the, and the cycle, the tide cycle that we're in right now. Man, I tell you, uh, one one real exciting part of this winter for me, and I don't know, uh, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about it a little bit there, Bobby, but the flounder fishing has been, or You're still I been catching flounder. them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Damn near every trip, I've been catching a couple of flounder. One, uh, one stop the other day in Dog River, I uh, was kind of posted up in one little spot off this point, and I caught three. Wow. In about not more than five minutes, but less than ten minutes. Got it with a you know about a couple dozen casts or whatever. Uh, that's and it seems like every time I've been in one of the rivers, I've been catching a few flounder every time, and that's kind of really kind of neat seeing this flounder fisher really come back around. Of course, we've been talking about it on the show for for uh, for months now, you know, from back in the fall. Yeah, but it's kind of neat with the flounder population that, and I, I'm real interested to see what Dylan's going to learn with his project down at the Sea Lab, you know. But we always were under the thought process that you know, winter time, the flounder get out of there and go out. In supposed the Gulf to be and gone. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then come on back in. But heck, we've been catching flounder in, uh, in particularly in Dog River has been great. And the other funny part about it too is like it seemed like early in the fall, after we had the first couple cold fronts, you feel like the flounder would have left and went offshore. We were catching a few then, and they were little bitty, like little 12, 13 inch flounder. Now I'm catching keeper sized flounder that are 14, 15 inches long. They may be more resident than we thought they were. Oh, for sure. Or either just the little ones don't go offshore like the big ones. But ah, yeah, true. It shows the growth, though, you know, because like a couple of years ago, or actually, Last year, uh, Dylan and I dart tagged a bunch of us mm -hmm. 
undersized flounder that were uh, not big enough to put the acoustic tag in. Tater chips. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a couple of those got recaptured. And I want to say Dylan told us that we we tagged one that was like 13 inches. He was at Liberty for like 230 days, got recaptured, and he was 18 inches long. You wow. know, so you went from like a like a one pounder to a three pounder in 230 days. That's you know? in a year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny that it, I'm kind of seeing that trend already, just in Dog River. You know, mm -hmm. not this winter time, man, but it's been uh, it's been great. Uh, I was kind of telling y'all before we started the show about uh, Captain Patrick was telling me uh, old uh, old positive Pat was telling me about working <laughs> a slick lure, a slick lure in like eight or nine foot of water. And he knew his bait was kind of up more towards the surface, three or four feet down, and got a thump, set the hook, and it was a flounder. You know, okay, I don't know if he came up off the bottom or if he was swimming along up in the water column or whatever, but it's been cool. I've been seeing a bunch of pictures and, you know, kind of talking to some of the uh, folks in my network about how good the flounder fishing's been. So I'm kind of looking forward to that, man. Next year's going to be like crazy, crazy. Maybe I can catch more than one per trip. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I tell you, we'll know it's good if I start catching them. I can tell you that, you know, but <laughs> what I was going to mention, Richard, to kind of uh, last year when they were, when you were doing that, that tagging towards the end of the summer and into the fall, um, you were telling me that what Dylan said that the thinking now is that maybe there's not this total mass migration offshore and that like, wow, that hit me between, I went like, whoa, cause I've always, I've always been that way. If I ever caught a flounder in the winter, I'm going like, what's he doing here? You know, but mm -hmm. you know, you were telling me that the thinking is maybe now there's some thinking that maybe they aren't all going offshore and doing that thing. And that's evidence of that, what you're talking about right there. Cause it was shocking. I used to shock me to catch a flounder during the winter. I mean, I just really was surprised. Uh, and I keep waiting for one of you guys to go, it shocks me if you ever catch one period. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, uh, man, well. I can no longer talk bad about your flounder fishing after my performance last year. So, <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, I forgot about it. We got Uno on here. That's right. <laughs> Maybe I can catch more than one next year on a, per trip. Oh, man. <laughs> Actually, speaking of which, today's Dylan's birthday. Uh, Is it? You'll laugh at this. I, I said, uh, I texted him. I said, happy birthday, number two. He goes... <laughs> If I'm number two, what's who's number one? I was like, no, flounder pounder, baby. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's evident. We got video evidence and audio evidence of that. Heck yeah, man. But, <laughs> That's uh, funny. It's actually man, my brother's I'm, birthday as well. I'm really looking forward to the next uh, next couple of weeks of fishing here. It, it looks like long range. We're going to uh, get this weather out of here by the end of the week. And then it uh, looks like next week's going to be a nice week. Going to kind of level out a little bit with the, uh, with the temperatures and everything. And everybody's going to get acclimated. Hopefully they'll be biting. Yep, I'll be looking forward to hearing the report next week. Yep, that's what you like to hear. You know, it's just like it's it's going to be what it's going to be instead of, you know, knowing, uh oh, I better get the day in because I know I'm shut down for the next three days. Where, right. you know, at least it's going to be it's gonna be still going to be cool, but it's not going to be crazy cold one day and then raining the next. And right, a little bit of stability. So I'm looking forward to it as well. That's exactly right. Well, that's a great report, Captain Bobby. We always enjoy hearing from you. Folks, when I get up with you and book a trip, uh, I think the uh, Mardi Gras special is still going on right now, correct? Through March 15th, that's right. And ateamfishing.com is our website. That's the easiest way to get us. It's got our phone number on there and a contact us form tab. You can fill out and get in touch with Miss Kim. She'll fix you up. Awesome. <laughs> that she, I've already screwed. I've been, I, I was off today and I've already screwed up a couple bookings. So she won't, she's not <laughs> letting me near the computer or the phone. So That's probably Lucky. for the best. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> stay away from the i got it i got it stay away don't reply i've already booked them you know so <laughs> stay away from the buttons no more buttons for you don't touch yeah <laughs> back away from the computer <laughs> oh man that's an awesome report we always uh enjoy hearing from you we look forward to hearing your next report cap keep whacking them we'll talk to you soon okay guys thanks for having me on all right, folks, that was another awesome report, and it was brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. With durability and convenience in mind, MB Ranch King's maintenance-free blinds are constructed with high-grade steel and come in a variety of sizes to meet any hunter's needs. They offer high-quality, easy-to-use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. And also brought to you by 
Boaters List. Boaters List is your new reliable and fast resource designed to link everyone to everything on the water. If you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Boaters List makes it easy to find the service that you are looking for. Locate anything from fuel docks to service repairs or rentals of large yachts, even down to paddle boards and all things in between. BoatersList.com will always strive to make it better on the water. All right, Captain Richard, we're going to get an update on the ACFA from the president, David Thornton, the old peer pounder. Welcome back to the show, Mr. David. How are we doing today? I'm good, Butch. How about you? Doing good, man. Just talking a little bit of fishing. Just, yeah. Weather's been a little crazy, but uh, it sounds like some fish are still out there and they're still biting a little bit. Yeah. One thing about the Alabama Coastal Fishermen's Association is that we really never stop fishing. We fish year round. Our season begins and ends in mid Feb in mid November rather, and in February we start up our meetings again. We have ten meetings through the year and eight tournaments, but we also have two year round contests. We have the big fish contest for twelve different species, and then we also have a catch photo release contest for six species and that's gotten to be pretty popular as well and you know it's a it's a great conservation ethic and all in that we're not just fishing for the biggest fish we can catch uh, some of these like speckled trout and redfish or slot species as well as oversized you know for for the catch photo release is just linked but the big fish contest is for weights so you know the fish that are tightly regulated like that that we we do have, you know, some minimum weights to meet and stuff like that. All that kind of stuff is available through our website at acfafish.com. A couple of things real quick, Mr. David. This is a this yeah. is a great club, by the way. I've uh, definitely be enjoyed being in it. Um, this is a great club from anybody from your first fish being a beginner angler to, to seasoned anglers. You guys have awesome tournaments throughout the year, like you were saying. At the ACFA meetings, there's, you know, Captain Bobby speaking, uh, Captain Richard Rutland speaking, Captain Patrick Garmerson speaking every now and again on several different topics. So it's a great club to be uh, in. How do you guys regulate the Catch Photo Release Tournament right now? Uh, right now, it's strictly you submit uh, photographs or a video um, of measuring your fish, and we just need to be able to identify the angler that they did in, indeed catch a fish, which, you know, it can be a challenge when you're fishing by yourself. But sure. what we do is uh, submit that, you know, just the species and the date that it was caught and the, the length and submit that to our statistician who keeps track of all of this and then that's ranked against other fish in the same species that have you know come in throughout the year also the fish that are caught in our tournaments automatically go into the big fish contest and they're sorted out you know so any any legal fish that you catch potentially could gain you points that we accumulate throughout the year and then uh, also earn plaques at the end of the year. In December, we have our awards banquet where we gather together for to have a, a dinner, and then we uh, celebrate the the winners throughout the year, both in the in the tournament season and the big fish contest and the catch photo release contest. So that's our big culmination. Hey, David. Uh, yeah. Tell tell us a little bit about where y'all meet, when you meet, uh, how to get involved, how to be a member, how to how to kind of get your feet wet for folks that, that aren't familiar with you. Um, uh, like Butch kind of said a little <laughs> while ago, I've been in and around the club for probably I don't know a long for a while. It's it's always been just a solid solid group of guys, uh, guys and gals. There's a lot, of, but plenty plenty of women at these things yeah. too, yeah. man. Uh, these days, uh, always kind of has been. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we've really tried to expand. The, the club has was founded in the prospect of, of a family fishing atmosphere. And we try to promote family fishing and conservation in a fun type atmosphere. In order to do that, we meet the first Thursday of each month, uh, starting February 3rd this year at Moe's and at their downtown location in Mobile off Spring Hill Avenue, uh, just before you get to Dolphin Street. And we, you know, have set up and, and try to get interesting speakers and try to get feedback from our uh, club members about what they want to hear about. And we've we've had a lot of good information come to us. You know, a lot of the guides like your yourself, you know, Bobby Abrascato and Patrick Garmison and other guides that have helped us out, you know, by talking to our members about either a specific species, like sometimes blackfish, 
uh, you know, triple tail. And at other times, you know, getting ready for things like the rodeo or for the winter fishing season or the summer fishing season and talk about tactics and tackle and things like that, that even experienced fishermen can always walk away and yeah. learn something new, you know, by listening to, to these uh, especially professional anglers who are out there on the water practically every day and, you know, can spread that knowledge a little more. And then there's always, you know, this air of camaraderie that goes along with, you know, you, you see ACFA stickers, you know, all over the place um, inshore. And it, it's because the club has been around for so long. It was started in 1997. And, uh, in fact, a, about a year ago, we lost our uh, our founding president, Mike Thompson, had um, passed about a year ago. And uh, we've you know, tried to recognize his contribution in different ways. We named our, our main contributor uh, trophy after him, nice. uh, you know, in his in his memory and all to keep that alive. And it's something it's a you know, I've been in the club since 2004. It kind of blew me away. I, I stayed away for a few years because I thought, you know, what do I as a peer fisherman can, what can I gain and what can I offer a club like this and come to find out? Uh, I had plenty to gain just in general fishing knowledge, but especially getting to know a lot of good folks. You know, like yep. Richard was saying, a lot of guys and gals that, and even kids that can fish competitively uh, against grownups. And it, it really is fun to be a part of and to I experience on, you know, not just on tournament day, but on, on a day to day uh, level and then when we get together for the meetings once a month it just really kind of brings everything together everybody kind of catches up and uh, there's a, a lot of talk and chatter about what's going on and a lot of information passed on different kind of bites and and different things that people have experienced and and just a, a wonderful wealth of knowledge that's uh, spread throughout the membership, which is uh, typically you know we'll have about a hundred people show up at these meetings. Yeah, it's a very good community. I've enjoyed all the meetings I've been to. Yeah, uh, David, just to, just to your point there about picking up something, this, that, and the other. All, every time, Ian, even even before I was, I, I guess we'll call myself a professional angler these days, guiding and tournament angler and all that. I, back, I, I remember me and my dad used to come there together. I mean, really seeking to find some knowledge. And I all, always, always pick something up. And even if I went to a meeting tomorrow night, if, if I showed up, I would learn something every time that I come to the meeting, uh, even as a professional angler thinking, I, and I know still that I don't know it all, but uh, always trying to pick some up. Actually, Patrick Garmison and I were talking on the phone today and we were talking about uh, a mutual friend of ours or whatever, and how much fun that person was to talk to because they're so animated and fired up about it. And we're all learning from each other all the time. And as inshore fishermen, if we're not trying to pick up something every time, every conversation, every fishing trip, and just trying to absolutely trying to grow yourself as an angler, I really think you're never going to be great. You might be good at it, but you're never going to be great if you're not constantly trying to sharpen your sword yep. and grow your arsenal and uh and everything like that well uh david it was really great having you on here and uh appreciate you telling us about the club and uh getting get some awareness out there man we really really appreciate having you on yeah folks want to look at you yeah. guys more and uh look at picking up a membership is there a website you guys can point them to it is it's acfafish.com that's one word and uh it'll point you to Everything that's going on, uh, club info, how to join or renew your membership, the uh, contest, current leaderboards, you know, upcoming tournaments, upcoming meetings, and, you know, a lot of other information as well. Uh, there's plenty of pictures to look at of different entries and, and our members throughout the year. And uh, we, we try to keep it updated and, you know, keep the, the interest fresh and keep the content fresh. And uh, so if you haven't it, you know, even if you've heard of us and you haven't visited us in a while, please check us out again. We're, you know, excited this year to be getting on board with Fishing Chaos. We think we can improve the quality of what we're doing for our membership as far as, you know, bringing them up to date, you know, contests and, and their entries. Uh, they'll be able to do these, you know, we'd like to be able to do our big fish entries and CPR entries remotely. Mm -hmm. instead of having to siphon everything through our statistician like we we have been doing so you know we're we're really hoping that this will be a fine joining between us and fishing chaos uh going forward 
And in fact, we're going to have John Caligas uh, from Fishing Chaos speak at our meeting Thursday, February 3rd. And then our, our next meeting will be March the 3rd. And uh, we're planning a presence, the boat shows this year. We'd like to, you know, participate in that and kind of get the word out. And, you know, we, we just have a lot of fun at the meetings and the tournaments. We have food at the tournaments and uh, nobody walks away hungry. And a lot, again, a lot of fishing information is, you know, transferred between the, the competitors and, and it's all good natured because we don't fish for money. We fish for points and, uh, bragging rights. you know, status bragging rights that's throughout right. the year. That's, that's right. it. Exactly. That's right. Yep. Well, uh, Pierre Pounder, uh, we're always, we're always talking to you about a fishing report. You're not giving a fishing report, but, uh, <laughs> give yourself a plug there. Tell some folks how to get a hold of you if they want to do, uh, do some beach or pier fishing and, uh, you don't have to sign her off here in a sec. Yeah. Thanks. I, I have a presence on Facebook and they can check it out at, peerpounder.com and that'll set them up on my Facebook page and show them their con- my contact information. Give a little information about the uh, peer and shore guide service that I provide and uh, the types of fishing that I do, you know, general costs and stuff like that. So it's a, uh, you know, good introductory kind of thing and how to contact me to, if they want more information. Perfect, man. So I appreciate the plug and, and like being on and talking to you guys anytime. I appreciate it. Heck yeah. Hope you guys are doing well and we'll talk to you next time. Absolutely. Keep whacking them out there. All right. We'll do. And hope to see y'all at the meeting. All right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. Y'all take a quick minute and check out a few of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts. The days of heading out and blindly looking for good fishing areas are pretty much over. Don't waste time and money on fuel searching for fish. You need the most recent, highest resolution images to not only know where to go, but where not to go. The knowledge provided by today's technology is critical when planning an offshore fishing trip. Make the choice that professional captains all over the Gulf make and choose Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. The easy-to-use interface and excellent customer service will have you on the fish every time you go. Check them out at hiltonsoffshore.com. All right, man, we're going to go get our last report, certainly not least. We're going to talk to Tanner Dees with Dolphin Island Fishing. I know he's been doing some stuff around the island and by the battery and all of the above and in between. Welcome back to the show, Tanner. How are we doing today, buddy? Oh, I'm doing good, Bush. Thank you for having me on. Captain yeah, Richard, man. nice to get on here and talk to you and hear from you, man. Tanner, you're about maybe one of the only people that give me a run from a nickname. Everybody at Dolphin Island calls me Didge, which stands for Dolphin Island Jesus. I usually got a pile of hair and a big old beard and everything. You're the only one that give me a run from the money down there, man. So, uh, yeah, I, man. Think he's, I think he's got your beat right now. I probably do. Oh, yeah, he for sure does. I just I just cleaned up uh, a couple days ago, you know, I'm trying to. Trying to stay in good graces with Miss Katie, you know, so she keeps having <laughs> the me. boss so, lady. Uh, I heard that. I heard that. I haven't shaved my beard since the accident. It was That's a vow awesome. that I made. I told myself I wouldn't shave until it was all said and done. Oh man, that's cool. That is cool. Well, Tanner, you and I never really officially met. We've uh, messaged a little bit back and forth or whatever, man. But I hear great things about you, so I'm glad to be on here with you today, man. Uh, what you been up to? What you been? You been killing anything? Uh, putting a put a little bend in the rod uh, here in the past couple of days. Not much at all in the past couple of days, but uh, I have been catching a few here and there. I had some real banner days prior to this past week, but it's kind of been the struggle bus down there on the land with these real negative tides, changing temperatures and weird pressure down there. I, I was unable to get on a good bite the past few days. My, my last successful day was Saturday. What have you been chasing? What was your last successful day? That last successful day, our target was sheep's head. But um, we were also throwing for trout and redfish in the areas. I kind of heard some reports from some people who were out of town, staying on the island, messaging me and asking me a little bit about fishing down there. They said they'd been catching some speckled trout and sent me some photos. They were throwing some bull minnows out on their dock. And hmm. they caught some nice ones, looked like some 20s, 22s. And spoke to a buddy that I have that lives down there. And he's been catching some trout down there in the bay that he lives on. And so really been trying to get after them and find them down there when I'm sheep's head fishing. But most of the time when I'm down there, especially Saturday, we were going for sheep's head. Yeah, but I'd kind of heard the same thing about the sheep's head bite being a little bit off uh, around the island. I know Patrick, uh, Captain Patrick's been catching some, I think kind of up the bay uh, a little ways, but I don't know what's going on with, with, the, with the island as far as the sheep head. I, 
sheephead fishing. I used to do a pile of sheephead fishing back in the day, and I kind of gotten, I guess, maybe a little snotty nose about it. You know, just well, I'm just addicted to these trout this time of year, man. I cannot leave it alone. It keeps me awake at night. You know what I mean? I wake up at the one o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking about a speckled trout. You know what I mean? That's uh, man. I totally you know, relate. Oh yeah, I completely but, uh, understand but, uh, that sensation. Oh yeah, so, so I've heard. Anyways, so I heard a couple of. Uh, a couple of my buds down at the island were catching a couple here or there, not but not whacking them, not really kind of getting after them. But uh, so what you're saying though, man, about this, ne- you know, talking about this low water, north wind, all that kind of stuff, with these negative tides and whatnot, it it makes it a challenge for everybody. I couldn't imagine uh, being, you know, living in your shoes, trying to uh, trying to do everything, not do everything. I know you get out on a boat, but or in kayak, kayak yeah, and all that, but. Trying to stay shore base and fish with some of that stuff. Golly, you know, you need to put your daggone waders on and get out there a little bit. You know, I don't know. Yeah, man. Uh, on these negative tides, you really just about have to. And I have put them on. Something about it, when it's real negative like that, the sheep's head aren't in the locations that I normally catch them when it's a normal tide or even a low tide. You know what I mean? It, just not a negative one, but a low tide. I'll go and fish these areas and it'll be three, four, five feet and, and I'm really catching them, you know, putting a limit in the ice chest or releasing them, whatever it is that I decided to do that day. And I've been going to some of these same areas and just, I mean, the past two days that I went, the 31st and the 1st, I literally caught one fish and probably 18 hours of fishing. Mm, that's tough. It's been a long time. Uh, let me tell you this about about being on this show. That's a uh, really admirable of you to get on here and be able to say that and not try to blow a bunch of smoke because that's that's what this show is all about. Is what we used to call it uh, the good, bad, good, the good, ugly. Bad, it's still uh, on the intro. We don't know, we used to call it. We still call it the good, bad, and the ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah report, man, you know, reports a report. Uh, well, we're high class now. We don't have to read in the intro anymore. You know, <laughs> that's but, right. Uh, you forget. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You know, that's, that's just part of it. You know, uh, you kind of hit these little, hit these little brick walls with fishing every once in a while. It's a tough man. time and, of year, man, for anything. Yeah, It's they, been a uh, long time get... since I went down there and I got skunk, dude. And it's been a long time since I went down there and just caught one fish. And, yeah. you know, that's just what it was. I put in the time. I repeated the same patterns that I do when I caught fish. I even opened up the door to go into the bayou on the first. I spent a whole half day at the island and then was like well i I really don't want to be empty-handed i mean you just talked about it it's a lot to admit you know getting on here but i'm not nearly as experienced as some of y'all and i got plenty to learn and i'm open to doing it and getting out there and just trying new stuff and going to new spots or getting on here and saying i had a crap day it is what it is man i'm sure there's something i can do to change it learn from you guys and learn from other fishermen and move on you know what i mean that's what it's all about for sure man i was going to ask uh whenever you're trying to target these redfish and speckled trout right now down there what do you, what are you doing what are your tactics maybe captain richard can weigh in on that i know captain richard doesn't do much land-based fishing but i'd be curious to see how he would tackle a day on the island if he if he didn't have a boat <laughs> so let's start with you tanner what do you do whenever you're down there this time of year well right now this time of year i'm going down there and i like to come when i'm fishing a rising tide or a fallen tide and so i kind of get there when the water's pretty much halfway through its tidal so that I don't catch a lot of low, low water right now, unless I just can't avoid it on my trip. So I try to get to those spots when they have higher water on them. I go down there, and if I'm trout or redfish in the location, it's going to be a paddle tail, probably an eight-ounce jig head. If I'm not throwing a paddle tail, it'll be like a trout trick or something like that, little slick. I've been throwing the pink passion a good bit here and there with the little slick and had some luck on the flounders doing that, but it was in a boat. And uh, getting in a boat and fishing some of the same areas and spots, I've had a lot of success catching redfish and flounder, but doing it on the land, hitting the same locations, throwing the same baits, doing the same stuff, Hmm. fishing the same time pattern, same tide pattern and everything no extra species. I'm able to target sheep's head in those spots and catch them on the land pretty easily, which is why the last couple of days was pretty surprising. But going down there and trying to target trout, redfish, or flounder on the land has proven to be much more difficult, even though I'm fishing the same spots that I would with my buddies in the boat or in a kayak or canoe by myself. I'll tell you one thing, uh, kind of what you're kind of getting at a little bit there. Uh, and I, kind of one thing I always kind of chuckle about, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a land guy, right? I'm a, I'm a boat guy. I'm always in a boat these days. And the, the, right. the thing I think, I think I want to, I want to say the thing that, you know, land-based 
versus boat guys are both always laughing at each other, right? Because your land guys are trying to throw <laughs> right. the, the lure the lure as far away from the bank as right. you possibly can. And then your boat guys are trying to throw it as close to the bank as you can and kind of work yeah. it back. And I think it's pretty funny if you I think, think about it. I, I, it. I know it's that's why hilarious. I laugh about it, you know. It's like it's like this damn battle we have against each other, you know. But uh but anyway, I think that that really goes both ways. You know what I'm saying? Some days the land guys For sure. do better throwing out. And then other days the, the, the boat guys are going to do better throwing up. You know, like I went and fished down around the island the other day and uh, had a pretty good day. But every, and I, I, it didn't take me long to figure out that every fish I was catching, I was inside the docks or the pilings, you know what I mean? Around the sea walls or wherever I was down there, you know, but other, I right. definitely see it the other way around where it wasn't where the fish were kind of pushed up around the structure and they were more out, you know, out away from it. So it's just one of the, one of those things you got to cover all bases, you know, and I, I guess that's one kind of cool thing about, about land-based deal. You know, if you're, uh, if you're fishing off docks, seawalls, stuff like that, your short game, as we'll call it, you're chipping and putting better be real good around those docks. <laughs> yeah. Just true. as good as being right. able to hit the long ball, like John, da John Daly, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> and get her on out there away from the dock, you know, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be able to cover all bases. That's kind of what's neat. Like I said about that. And that's kind of, uh, something I always, uh, think is kind of cool about the kayak guys. I probably only kayak fished about, I don't know, 10 times in my life. But those guys can kind of get places that I can't even dream of getting in a boat. Right, in your boat. Yeah, and you're super stealthy, not making a lot of noise. This fish really, I, I practically don't even know you're there because you're not displacing any water or, uh, or anything like that. You don't have boat noise, hull slap, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of neat how it works both ways sometimes. Yeah, I think it's really cool. I mean, essentially, we're both targeting the same areas whether we're on land or in a boat, we're looking for the same stuff when we're going for pretty much the same fish. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty hilarious, but <laughs> at the same time, you know, you, you get out there and um, there'll be days that I, I just, you know, banner days and then repeat the same thing. And, and it's not there. And it's just like a boat. You can go to a spot one day, tear them up and then go to the same spot. And they're just not there. They move. They're crazy. You got to learn them and find them. For sure, man. Speaking of moving, I heard you got a little offshore one day, caught some vermilion snapper and a couple of uh, throwback amberjacks, maybe your first. Kind of give us a little rundown on your offshore trip. Yeah, man. I uh, I got to take a little trip offshore. It's something that I've done here and there, not a lot in the past. And uh, mm -hmm. I got to get on the boat with Captain Collier and my buddy Matt Swiggs, and they both have YouTube channels and recorded the trip. We got out there and caught over 40 or 50 B liners, probably. Uh, Five or six small amberjack, white snapper, something called a squirrel fish. Caught several of those. That's great, that's great bait. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I heard. I brought one home and ate it. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? Tell me about that. <laughs> it was actually pretty good. It's good white meat. I've definitely butterflied some. It's white meat. Yeah, it's a sea bass. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good. We caught those. Yeah, we caught plenty of red snapper. I mean, we live in Alabama, so we know how good that type of fishing is. Oh yeah, yeah I was gonna ask what what is that? What is a red red what? <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, you don't know? <laughs> Just go <laughs> go out there about forty feet. You'll find one. How far did you guys go out, Tanner? We went thirty or forty miles that day, and uh, it was a little sporty. It was really cold and really windy, and the uh, you know we were just talking about that earlier. It's it's hard to battle multiple conditions that are harsh but it was super cold super windy and the seas were not as forecasted when we got out there but we made it happen good deal man so yeah. talking about those vermilion snapper a little bit what kind of rigs were you using what was your favorite bait just kind of walk me through your uh tactic there like what was your you guys using circle hooks and absolutely yes sir so we all kind of had pretty similar rig ups we all had four six ounce weights on little knocker egg type system or I don't even know what it's called. You put the weight on the bottom and you got multiple hooks going up with chicken three rig. or four circle hooks. Oh. Yeah. Chicken rig. There you go. And we had size two circle hooks or size two octopus circle hooks on there. We just put cut squid on there every now and then catch something and cut it up and throw it on there and see if cut baits were working better than the squid. But most of the time we were just dropping squid. We had success with the little slow pitch jigs catching bigger fish you know that pull a little harder but most of the time it just ended up being snapper that was how we caught the um 
small amberjack though and and that was fun it was cool to go out there and, and cross multiple species off my list the vermilion snapper is pretty commonly caught but i never caught it and never caught any white snapper or anything like that and so got to go out there and catch a few things and bring them home and cook them that was yeah. really cool oh yeah all those things you're talking about are very 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 tasty very tasty let me tell you something about a chicken rig and my buddy butch theory on here this <laughs> joker can tie a chicken rig blindfolded with two hands tied behind his back okay his daddy oh yeah he's um, practiced huh mike, mike theory oh my goodness i do that joke could come out the womb trying to uh tie a chicken rig okay <laughs> you're not you're not wrong there. you said behind my back and upside down blindfolded but i could do it underwater oh, yeah. too i've had to tie them up before i just didn't know what they were called <laughs> Yeah, we call them two hook rigs or chicken rigs. That's what your standard uh, charter boat operation runs. Uh, two hook rigs, you know, yeah, three the same way. Well, that's cool, man. Glad okay. you got to get offshore. Those are a main snapper, are delicious. That's always my jam. Whenever I, uh, whenever I get on your brother's boat, on Skipper's boat, with you know, on the Sea Lab trips, the rodeo, mm -hmm. the JC trip, or something like that, I'm I stay on that two hook rig. I'll take I'll take one turn on the big rod on the back, but I love a chicken rig, man. That's fun. Same. I mean, it's just. Yeah, it was really fun, nonstop action. You sit there and catch yep. a two fish at a time. I mean, come on. Yep. It's like a dog in a boat. Beat it. Uh, what do you What do you think is going to come up here with this crazy weather? I mean, I think we were looking earlier, the high Friday and Saturday is going to be like low 50s, 51 one day and 40-something one day. After these warmer temperatures that I had and the bad bite that was leading up to the warmer temperatures, I'm I'm kind of ready for it to be cold and to have to bundle back up because – that was when I had the most successful bite. I went out there. I Like I said, it was crap on the 31st and the 1st, but on the 29th, I had a struggle day throughout the day, and then from 3 to 5.30, we caught over 30 or 40 sheep's head. And then two days later, when it got warm, I couldn't get a bite. So I'm ready for it to get cold. I hope it heats up. Maybe that makes a difference. I'm sure Captain Richard knows a little more about that than I do. Well, uh, hey, something I was gonna say uh, when you were, when you were talking about that, like how, you know, you had a you had a real good day of success, and then went back, kind of same area, did the same thing, two days in a row. I tell you, I almost make it a point sometimes to not do the same thing twice. Like, I mean, I'm right. talking about whenever I get whenever I get in my charter charter season, you know, and I'm running, I'm fishing every single day, and I, I always tell everybody I'm kind of I'm I'm a conditions fisherman, you know, so like. When I talk about conditions, we're talking about wind or wind direction, tide movement, tide level. I mean, I pay attention to the tide level probably more than I pay attention to my kids. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I check, I check the, I check the uh, like the real time tide movements on my uh, on my phone as much as I as much as I do anything. Uh, heck, I didn't even go fishing today, and I probably looked at it four times today. You yeah, know? it's so, a disease, really. It, it I mean, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, you got to kind of, that's, that's how I try to, I don't know, li live in the, live in the fish world is to, is to be a conditions guy. You know what I mean? I don't like to think about being like a spot fisherman. Now there are some days I will sure. go to the same place three or four days in a row. You know what I mean? If it's, if it's that good, it's that good. You know it, but, uh, but the, but day -to -day, the conditions are gotta, consistent. That's right. It almost feels wrong for me sometimes to go like, like if I go to, go to spot a b and c one day and do good i don't want to go to a b and c the next day you know what i mean i just feel like it's bad juju or something you know gotta change it up like, gotta keep them guessing keep yeah, them on our toes yeah you do you know and you learn you learn something every time every time you go hop around like that but kind of following that up for whatever reason man in the winter time they can be on i mean just slap on fire and then and then and then shut off like that and that's where you really start to you know, connect the dots, uh, keeping fish logs and things like that, logging your trips and saying, yes, sir. You know, writing stuff down in a notebook or typing it up and putting it in a file on your computer. You can't and then type. Going you don't back. have a computer. You can't work a computer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, th that stuff doesn't really start to pay, you know, doesn't start to pay dividends until a couple of years down so you the put road. The time, man. That's right. That's a great, that's a great yeah. point. So that, that's when you really start to connect the dots, I think, especially, you know, that's one thing Captain Bobby always talk about, you know, that, that those log books really come in handy, um, like in your transition periods. Well, we're about to come up in a transition period, like in, in a, about a month, you know, uh, when we hit March and some of these fish are going to start to start to go into springtime mode. I'm ready. 
Oh yeah. No, I'm not ready for spring yet. I'm still loving me some winter time. Me fishing, too. Man. I love, I love like catching these fish up in the rivers and stuff, man. That's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm not quite ready for it. I, I will be soon. I'm just not as versed with the speckled trout in the winter time as you guys. And last spring, summer, and fall, those specks were just on fire for me around the beach areas. And I, I can't wait to get back into that type of bite because just like you say, you dream speckled trout. Me too, man. I love it. And uh, <laughs> sheep's head just get me through the winter. <laughs> That's right. Keep, oh, yeah. Nah, keep the tug. Tug is the drug, right? Uh, sounds like we right. got an addict on our. Well, it sounds like we got an addict on our hands. Uh, I think so. Uh, there, Butch. Yeah, yeah you got, got that old tug got drug going, don't you, huh? Got that tug itch. That's right. <laughs> that tug drug, man. I love it. Oh man, that's a great conversation, Tanner. That's a great report. If folks want to follow you and keep up with your shenanigans, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Man, check me out at Dolphin Island Fishing on Instagram, Tanner D's on Facebook, and do some video work with Captain Collier and Salty Swigs and. Just recently got on Bearded Brad and met him and did some stuff with him. So y'all stay in touch and watch what I do on their channels and stuff like that. And keep up with me on Instagram. It's a great time. Hope to get out there and fish with uh, you and Richard sometime. Learn something. I'm sure there's more in the book that I can learn. And uh, I can't wait to go catch some trout or something soon. Will do, man. Looking forward to it. Be safe out there. We'll talk to you next time. Yes, sir. Y'all be blessed. All right, Captain Richard, uh, you know we got to do what did you learn, man? I know I picked up a bunch this week. Do you have anything in particular you picked up from this show? What would you learn? Man, I'm just telling you, we're doing this Zoom meeting. I'll tell you uh, one thing I learned, getting to look at your pretty face the whole time. You are a <laughs> QT pie. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm getting I like did three shave hours to get a haircut this, this week. Oh, yeah, golly. Nah, <laughs> man, uh, you you are pretty. But, uh, you know, what I learned this week, uh, it's just uh, we're kind of in that typical – wintertime pattern uh right now i say and i say typical we're having a little bit cooler event this winter than than past winters than i can remember i mean i i remember being in sh straight up shorts and in performance shirts and in, in february before you know oh you never know yeah or it can be the coldest month out of the year but that's right but uh never the, know. the nice thing is is that the water temperature's gotten on down you know so it's kind of concentrated the fish in uh in some of the areas you know but uh kind of like what we're getting off with tanner right there you know he's talking about having having a couple of tough days and that's that's just gonna happen you know this time of year these fish one thing i wanted to say right there was sorry to interrupt you i wanted to say this a minute yeah. ago and i actually meant to say it during tanner's um and i know you and i and bobby talk about it all the time if he's having great days and then bad days in between the warm-ups and the cool downs that's because those fish are shocked they don't have time yep. to acclimate to the hot and then it turns around to get cold they don't have time to acclimate to the cold yeah, they're as confused as we are, probably. Yeah, no doubt. You know? Like, what in the hell is happening? <laughs> the the one thing I think that we can kind of all relate to with everything is everything is kind of relating more towards the bottom. You know, that's where yep. the warmer, more stable water is going to be, and you're going to more salinity. Really kind of, you, yep, exactly. And you're going to want to you're going to want to focus on the, the the deeper areas relative to everything else. You know what I mean? Man, I tell you, I had a. Uh, I just had a thought I was thinking about. I wanted to mention uh, during Bobcat's report, we were talking about um, about finding fish in some of these tidal rivers and whatnot. The one really cool thing about this winter is that it's gotten finally gotten cool. The water temps have gotten cool enough. It's gotten most of the bait out of out of the tidal rivers and out out of the inshore shallower areas. Better uh, late than never, that right? Were, that yeah. <laughs> and and what's helped me lately is. If I see one pogey flip or one mullet jump or one any kind of bait activity, you know, or watching my electronics and see a bait pile somewhere or whatnot, there's been fish around those kind of areas, you know, sure. when you're starting to see that. So you get in an area, you know, if you like or whatever, you know, it don't take much, you know, but you see a little bit of sign. There's not a whole lot of bait activity right. in any of the tidal rivers right now. I can't speak for some of them, but I know the ones I've been fishing in, you know, all it takes is just a just a little bit of life to show itself. Yeah, pay and, attention, uh, and I've been I've been I've been jumping on that, and it's definitely paid some dividends. You know, uh, paying to attention know. to all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. I think one thing but, that I picked uh, up on this week was your antidote about you know I think but Captain Bobby was talking about you know a, a more streamlined or a little split tail 
jigs. I don't know what he, a fluke is what I call it. You know, like, like yeah. bass fishing, you call it a fluke. That's interesting, man. I guess that could be due to the fish's diet this time of year because Captain Bobby's right. This fish, you know, this time of year, they got the red belly and their fins. You know, you can tell they're down there on the bottom. So that would definitely oh, yeah, make they sense the if they were light. Yeah. got the different they little got the lice and everything on them. Yeah. So you know, they're just rubbing all up in that mud. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, what you said about, uh, you know, they're matching the hatch, right? If they're down there grubbing on worms and eels, that makes a ton of sense that they would like a fluke other than a paddle tail. That's right. And I tell you the big thing to me, too, when you get to this time of the year and you get these colder water temperatures and we're in, in what's happening, like what we're talking about, Bobcat's report about um, about getting bites and not hanging fish and all that, you just got to slow down. You know yeah. what I mean? You can't, you got to slow down, scale down. And the bites for me have been real subtle, if at all, feeling anything. You know, sometimes you go to jig and you feel like you hung or something. You better snatch it because it, oh, yeah. it, it, a lot of times that's a bite. You know, you never you never felt it. They just kind of barely picked it up or came up behind. You know, you just, just, you, just licked it a little bit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so anywho, you just it, that, it, the wintertime is a, is a uh, is a fun time to really, uh, really tune up your your artificial hone your, artificial your, hone your craft if you will oh yeah that's it that's it that's what's fun about it man i just i love it and it and it gets to be uh you know like you, you, you every one of us has days like what tanner was kind of talking about in his report where you you know you don't you don't quite hit pay dirt uh, oh, yeah. on a couple of trips but it, the, the one thing i love hearing tanner talk about in his report man is that joker is mad at him he yep. is gonna go and go and grind and grind and grind and that's what it takes to get good at this stuff man you really yep. got he you loves gotta it. get you gotta you gotta want it you know so it's good to see some uh some young guys out there uh and like his all his buddies with his youtube channels and whatnot uh they're all about i think about the same age kind of a little bit younger yep. uh younger generation coming up not that i'm old by any means but um <laughs> they, that's uh, all relative too right to the water level. oh yeah rel that's exactly right relative, relative that's yeah. relative term yeah that's right uh but <laughs> them boys are mad at it man i love i love seeing the uh the intensity there yeah me too all right guys that wraps up another great segment it's like a quick break check out a few of this week's great sponsors that segment was brought to you by sam stop and shop sam stop and shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 canal road in orange beach Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Sam's also has tackle experts and podcast contributors, Chris Beche and Dusty Hayes, on hand to answer any questions you may have about any type of local fishing and can also repair your rods and reels if necessary. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. Captain Richard, it's always a pleasure, man. I'm glad you uh, let me host this show with you today. <laughs> yes, sir, man. Thank you for having me on, man. I had a blast, man. We had a uh... Had some uh, had some good folks on here today. Got a, got some good knowledge flowing, man. Can't wait to the next one. We really uh, covered a lot of water, so to speak. We went, we went from we went a long we <laughs> went a long say. ways. We went a long way. <laughs> you don't say, huh? <laughs> man, I know oh, you're always man. a wealth of knowledge, and you're always willing to uh, do whatever you know your clients want to do. It's uh it's coming up on a time like Tanner was talking about. Spring is a lot of fun. March, April, May, June is a great wade fishing time. I know I want to get on a bunch of that. I'm sure your bookings are looking up for probably May, June, July, August. I know you book way out ahead, but if folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Man, uh, good old internet, coldbloodedfishing.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram. And uh, if you want to use the old landline, uh, got a uh, telephone number. It's 251-459-5077. Give me a call. Shoot me a text, man. Be glad to get you on my schedule. Heck yeah, man. Enjoyed it. Look forward to getting out with you soon and uh, keep whacking them. Be safe out there, buddy. Yes, sir. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. We'll talk to y'all next week. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Admiral Shellfish.
fish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants. They can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. Admiral Oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Whether you are hitting the sand with a set rig using the traditional scent strips for pompano or fishing the flats or marshes for speckled trout, redfish, and flounder, Fish Bites has something for you. Fish Bites baits and lures are made with pride in the sunshine state of the USA. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting. Fortified Roofing Pros. Enjoy less stress knowing you have reduced your risk for damage with Foster Contracting. Check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-447-2978. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. Also by Killer Doc. Killer Dock uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more. And also brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. Do not let an achy tooth ruin a day on the water. Call today to book an appointment at 251-342-6672. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Photonis Defense PD Pro Ultra Light Ultra Compact Night Vision Systems. Simply the best in-class night vision systems ever built. Contact them at photonisdefense.com to learn more. Photonis Defense, Masters of Darkness. And also brought to you by The Hunting Exchange. Hunting Exchange is an app for iOS and Android that gives you a one-stop shop to buy and sell your hunting gear. This secure platform allows you to buy and sell gear with confidence. So head on over to the App Store or Google Play and experience a new hassle-free way to buy and sell hunting gear by downloading the Hunting Exchange app today. 